Hello and welcome to today's webinar with IOP eBooks authors Patrick Horton and David Eaton. David is retired from the Royal Surrey County Hospital NHS Foundation Trust UK and David is lead clinical scientist at the National Radiotherapy Trials QA Group Mount Vernon Hospital Northwood in the UK. During the webinar, we welcome your questions, so please use the Q&A facility to send them in at any time during the talk. Patrick and David will then try to answer as many as they can at the end of the presentation, and we will respond to any unanswered questions once the webinar is over. On that note, I shall hand over to David. Thank you for the introduction. I will take a few minutes to describe the background and the rationale for producing this report. And then my colleague Patrick will go into the details of the contents for each of the different chapters. Now I appreciate we have an international audience uh, for this webinar, so let me start just by talking about the Institute of Physics and Engineering in Medicine, which is the lead professional body for medical physicists and clinical engineers in the United Kingdom, but also has members and seeks to benefit medical physics and clinical engineering around the world. This is through a combination of research, innovation, education, and clinical practice. And you can see some of the strategic objectives of the Institute, which include setting and influencing standards and best practice, uh, and strengthening engagement and influencing decision makers. So as part of that, the Institute produces reports. And in radiotherapy, uh, we've had a few different reports over the last few years on commissioning linear accelerators, intensity modulated radiotherapy, and most recently on small field dosimetry, which was particularly popular worldwide because of its timely and helpful guidance. But we appreciate that these hard copy reports aren't necessarily uh, most accessible for people around the world, and so we've been looking for different formats and different ways of uh, making this guidance, this best practice available. One way we've done this is through topical short reports. The first of these was published in the Journal of Physics and Medicine and Biology, which is owned by the Institute, but is also uh, published by IRP Publishing. And this covered flattening filter-free beams in radiotherapy, which is a new modality where you have a higher dose rate, you take away the flattening filter, and it has its own challenges as well as advantages. And I would commend that report to you if you haven't already seen it. It's the most popular downloaded article from PMB last year. But alongside these, we recognized the need for larger reports that were more comprehensive and covering a wide range of topics. And so IPEM and IOP Publishing entered into an agreement to create a series of e-books across the whole range of medical physics and biomedical engineering. And this book on radiation shielding forms the first in that series. This is the front cover. Uh, you can see the title, Design and Shielding of Radiotherapy Treatment Facilities. And it's an update of IPEM Report 75, which was published 20 years ago. So quite a lot has changed in the meantime. One of the changes is flattening filter-free Linux, which present different uh, parameters in terms of shielding calculations. There's also much greater use of IMRT and VMAT, rotational arcing techniques, compared with uh, older models. And there's also specialist treatment techniques, such as gamma knife, tomotherapy, and cyber knife. And these each have individual features, like beam stoppers or a different range of angles, which they can point at, which have an impact on the shielding design. So we wanted to include these aspects in a report that covered all these different modalities. Alongside these changes, there have been new shielding materials, such as high-density concrete, magnetite is one example, and precast blocks, which are increasingly popular in terms of creating a bunker more quickly by having all these blocks delivered and then you just stack them all up and, and join them together. There are also new bunker designs. Often the space is limited in hospital uh, facilities, and so it's not always possible to have a long maze. So increasingly sites are looking at mazeless bunkers with doors instead. So we've tried to cover all of those aspects in the empirical calculations, but also recognize that Monte Carlo methods can be used to simulate the amount of radiation that is expected at different parts around the facility. This little plot shows the scatter coming off uh, one particular setup towards the maze door. 
And this gives us an opportunity to talk about the latest regulations in terms of radiation safety. In the UK, these are due to be renewed at the beginning of next year, but they're based on European directives, which will apply across the whole uh, continent and similar uh, guidance is available around the world. And there's really been nothing on this area for over 10 years. There were a couple of uh, reports by the IAEA and by the NRPB, but these are over 10 years old and they don't cover the full range of equipment or modalities or materials or methods which are currently available. And the final aspect we wanted to include was particle therapy and proton therapy. In the UK, we're having a bit of a uh, a building race to see who can uh, build the first proton centre. There are two public health centres being built in London and in Manchester, and there are currently four private centres being constructed. And there's some news articles you can see here about the the first uh, cyclotron. When they talk about the machine arriving, they mean the cyclotron arriving, which is the object being lowered down in the bottom right there through the roof. One of these is in Newport, one of these is in the Christie in Manchester. And so we, as well as the existing facilities around the world, there's a real growth area in particle therapy and lots of new centres opening. And these present their own particular challenges in terms of shielding. So now let me hand over to Patrick to talk about the contents of the report in a little bit more detail. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this slide shows the 12 chapters in the report. Uh, starting off in a very general way with uh, project management and general um, arrangements for radiotherapy facilities, and then moving on to more specific things. Obviously, radiation protection requirements are, are the background to, uh, to the requirements for shielding. Then a chapter on clinical practice uh, to explain uh, <coughs> current clinical practice to people who are not familiar with radiotherapy. Then on to the traditional methods of empirical shielding calculations. Then a chapter on Monte Carlo methods that David just mentioned. A chapter on shielding materials and construction details. Then the specialist applications again, also just mentioned. And then on to well-established kilovoltage therapy and newer electronic brachytherapy. Brachytherapy with sealed sources. Radiation shielding and safety for particle therapy facilities and then shielding verification and radiation surveys on completed facilities, and finally a glossary of uh, terms to explain them to those who are not so familiar with radiotherapy. So going through each of the chapters in turn, the, uh, the, the first chapter is really about the design and procurement process. Um, it, it, for various radiotherapy facilities, this includes the business planning process, facility construction, equipment procurement, acceptance and commissioning, and ensuring that all the professions that who need to be involved in the design and the implementation are included to make sure the project has a successful outcome. And this scenario has been um, looked at in three um, schemes of different scale. Minor capital projects, which might be just replacing a single piece of equipment, such as a linear accelerator, major capital projects, um, such as extending a department, perhaps with new bunkers with linear accelerators, and thirdly, public-private partnerships, which have been used for larger developments, such as a new cancer center, where the uh, healthcare organization works in conjunction with a consortium of a bank, a construction company, and a maintenance company to build the facility. And obviously, in this situation, communication between the design team and the, the, the private partnership is very important. The second chapter is a general introduction to the different types of radiotherapy equipment and their requirements for safe operation. It covers linear accelerators, including the specialist configurations we just mentioned, kilovoltage therapy, brachytherapy with sealed sources, electronic brachytherapy, and particle therapy. And in, the, in this chapter, general information is provided for each modality on the radiation shielding arrangements, engineering controls for safe operation, and support facilities required to enable the broad planning of radiotherapy facilities from a single treatment room to a, 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 f a full cancer center. 
Chapter 3 describes the radiation protection requirements for all forms of radiotherapy, based largely on the UK legislative framework, but as David has indicated, has more general uh, um, recognition. Um, the chapter covers other radiation protection aspects, such as prior risk assessments, engineering controls, and further requirements that, such as uh, instant reporting, contingency plans, and so forth. Chapter 4 has three sections. Uh, the, the slide in front of you uh, is about the first section, and it describes the current treatment techniques for the benefit of people who are not directly involved in radiotherapy. And you can see them listed there in the upper half of the slide. Um, and it, it, it concludes with a section on identifying the radiation workload at the ISA Center for a treatment unit using the quantities you can see in the lower part of the slide so that, so that the person designing the shielding is very clear about that the radiation workload at the ISA center, and this of course is the start of planning the, the shielding. There are two other sections uh, in this chapter on treatment room design and control room design. And though these are not about radiation protection, they're, they're very important for the efficient operation of the facility once it's completed and uh, to, to have a, as reasonable an environment as possible for, for the patient. And you can see the sort of features that are, uh, are described in the upper half for treatment room design, including, for example, light, lighting, which it has to be very uh, carefully designed to be, for, with dim lighting for radiographers setting up the patient, bright lighting for maintenance uh, of the machine, and intermediate lighting, perhaps, for during patient treatment. There's also a section on control room design, and control room design now has to take account of a much larger number of image monitors than it used to with, with the uh, addition of patient imaging as very much part of, of patient treatment. Ch Chapter 5 describes the different layouts used with linear accelerators and includes the calculation of primary and secondary barriers and scatter down the maze for both x-rays and neutrons. And in this situation, of course, one has to take into account scattered by the patient, uh, scatter, leak, head leakage from the linear accelerator, scatter from the walls, and, uh, and radiation transmitted through the inner maze wall. And all, all these aspects are, are carefully described. And for linear accelerators operating above 8.5 MV, neutron scatter has to be considered at the maze entrance as well. Sky shine for uh, linear accelerator bunkers with a thin roof where there's no access above. And ground shine for uh, facilities with thin walls uh, are also considered. Uh, for situations where a maze is not appropriate, the construction of maze doors, uh, direct doors, uh, are also uh, included. And finally, there's a, a short section on laminated barriers where you have to perhaps insert steel in the, in, in the primary shielding when there's insufficient room to make the barrier entirely of concrete. And this had needs special considerations by virtue of the neutron production if uh, the linear accelerator is operating at a higher energy. As David has mentioned, Monte Carlo methods have now become uh, an important adjunct for checking bunker design. In fact, one could do the complete design with modern computing techniques, with high-power computers. Uh, the, the modeling codes are uh, listed there in the slide, and the pros and cons of each are described. And in the bottom half of the slide, you can see that if one's going to use Monte Carlo modeling, then one has to be very careful about the source characteristics, the components of the treatment head of the linear accelerator, and also the room geometry and, and the materials the room is made of. Room shielding can be provided by a number of materials, and these can be poured and poured concrete and blocks, steel, lead, and so forth. 
and all these are considered in detail in the first section of chapter 7. The second section deals with materials where the, where the TVL has not been specified, perhaps because it's not known, and this particularly applies to high-density materials, or sometimes commercial in confidence. And the way to, to calculate the TVL then is to do it an inverse relationship with density to the TVL for concrete. And this has proved very satisfactory for us checking a number of high density bunkers, concrete high density uh, shielded bunkers. And uh, the results of those are included to help up people uh, achieve the same aim. This, in fact, is a conservative approach because it relies on the Compton effect and doesn't take into account pair production. So you, in, you, you, you actually underestimate the TVL, which is very helpful in, in, in arriving at a conservative design. And lastly, this chapter has a section on construction details, um, details that need to be thought about if you're to avoid any uh, weaknesses in the integrity of shielding, and also the, the precautions that need to be taken when uh, having ducts through the shielding, as inevitably is the case for dissimetry, air condition, and so forth. Chapter 8 is about the specialist applications that have already been mentioned, the gamma knife, tomotherapy, and cyber knife. Um, the gamma knife um, contains cobalt-60 sources with a total activity of 230 mega becquerel and is used to treat brain lesions. Tomotherapy has a 6 MV linear accelerator mounted on a a CT-like gantry which rotates around the patient, and CyberKnife has a 6 MV linear mounted on a robot arm. In the case of the, the gamma knife and the tomotherapy, very little of the primary beam escapes from the equipment, and most of the radiation dose around the machine is, is secondary radiation, and it's very difficult to calculate uh, empirically. So in these two situations, the manufacturer provides isodose plots from which one can then extrapolate to calculate the shielding required. In the case of the cyber knife, because the beam is not confined to a single plane like, like a linear accelerator but can be pointed in any direction, all the walls of the, of the, of the, of the uh, bunker need to be primary barriers. The roof can often be a secondary barrier because the machine is not allowed to point above 22 degrees. Both the tomotherapy and the cyber knife are IMRT machines, and so they have long exposure times with consequences for secondary shielding. Chapter 9 has two sections. The first describes water voltage therapy using x-rays in the range 150 to 300 kVp, and, and superficial therapy using x-rays in the range 50 to 150 kVp. Worked examples and physical data for shielding calculations are included in this section of the chapter. The second section outlines equipment that's become available in recent years for electronic brachytherapy, in other words, brachytherapy not with a sealed source, but with an electronically generated source. And this is either 50 kV x-rays, sorry, or, or electrons in the range 4 to 12 MeV. And of course, these therapies are not necessarily confined to the radiotherapy department. And whilst the radiation protection measures are not uh, extensive, they, they do need to be carefully thought about and, sy and, and good systems of work uh, are described in the chapter. Chapter 10 describes the radiation protection measures for the use of sealed radioactive sources in brachytherapy. This covers high dose rate remote afterloading and pulse dose rate afterloading, both using cesium-137 sources, I-12Cs for permanent implantation for prostate brachytherapy, and i plaques. For the first two techniques, HDR and PDR, the uh, Physical data and worked examples for shielding calculations and engineering controls for safer operation are described. For the latter two, uh, the seeds and IAPLACs, 
suitable radiation protections and, sy and systems of work are described. Chapter 11 is a comprehensive description of the issues that need consideration in the design and shielding of particle therapy facilities, especially for proton therapy. Shielding is primarily against neutrons generated when the particle flux interacts with equipment components and the patient. In this chapter, accelerator and equipment variants are outlined together with the sources of neutrons. Shielding design and all the issues such as activation, monitoring and so forth needed for safe operation are described. And the chapter also includes a very comprehensive list of the factors that need to be thought about in designing a safe facility that will also um, be able to accommodate new treatment techniques. Chapter 12 is, has two parts. The first describes the checks and, that need to be undertaken during construction of the facility uh, to prevent any problems. This is sort of making sure that uh, the builders don't leave any, any, any weaknesses in the, in the structure. And, and, and secondly, the radiation survey that must take place at the completion of, of, of the installation to ensure that the external dose and dose rates meet statutory requirements and so forth. And the image right there on the lower right shows that the value of, of uh, performing a radiation survey where you can see there's a thick line of grout here uh, right at isocenter level, unfortunately, which resulted in a dose rate, an instantaneous dose rate of 35 microsieverts per hour at this point when a 15 MV beam was pointing horizontally clearly in excess of the 7.5 microsievert per hour uh, dose constraint applicable in the, in the country concerned. So to conclude, the aim of IPM Report 75 Second Edition is to provide a comprehensive guide for external beam therapy and brachytherapy facilities, to provide a background on the radiation protection measurement requirements that need to be met, to provide an understanding of current radiotherapy practice and the information required for the calculation of radiation workload, IMRT and use factors, all of which come into calculations of shielding, to enable the calculation of adequate shielding using empirical methods and to provide an appreciation of Monte Carlo techniques, uh, to provide an update on shielding materials and recommend values for TVLs, X-ray scattering coefficients, for example, when X-rays are scattered down the maze, to provide guidance on construction details, and finally to provide an introduction to the shielding required for particle therapy facilities. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much um, to both of you uh, on that really interesting presentation. We've had some questions come through, so I will just start to read them out, and um, and then if you could answer. Um, so the first question we've got through is asked about the contributors to the report and how did you go about choosing those contributors? Shall I answer that one? Um, well, first of all, the IBM set up a working group um, <clears throat> on the basis of the, the, the points described by David um, about why it was felt it would be a good idea to have a, a new edition of, of Report 75. And the original five members of the working group um, were established members of the NHS radiotherapy physics community who gained a lot of experience with designing and checking uh, radiotherapy facilities, principally bunkers, during the uh, expansion of the UK cancer facilities in the late 1990s and early 2000s. However, they didn't have the detailed knowledge of some of the newer techniques, and so through IPM's radiotherapy special interest group, um, we helped, uh, they ha helped identify other radio services with the specialist knowledge and experience required to write well-informed chapters on these topics. So overall, there are 22 contributors, most work working jointly with others. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, um, what are the sources of the physical data? So, for example, value or tenth value layers, TVLs, and X-ray scattering coefficients used in the report? Uh, again, I'll answer that if you like. The, the, the data from the linear, for linear accelerator bunkers are largely taken from NCRP 151. This has excellent data 
on linear accelerators, though in fact it's largely limited to accelerators. The data for radiation protection for kilovoltage facilities was taken from the BIR report, Radiation Shielding for Diagnostic X-rays, some British standards data in a paper by Trout and Kelly in 1972. And the data from the sealed source bracket therapy was taken from IPM report 75 and NCRP 151. Okay, thank you. Um, and who, who would you say is um, the book aimed at? I, mean, I think we, we hope that it will be aimed at the widest possible audience. Typically, uh, when designing the shielding, there will be a qualified expert. In some countries, that's called a radiation protection advisor or radiation protection expert who will be legally required to provide advice on the design of the shielding. But we recognize that these projects involve a wide range of different staff groups, contractors, local hospital um, estates and all sorts of people really and we, so part of the aim of chapter one is to talk about the wider framework of how you uh, generate these projects and trying to get the right people in the room at the right time to avoid any snags along the way so we do hope it will be of use to administrators planners architects constructors and all those involved in the design of radiotherapy facilities and indeed for students as well people of different uh, stages in their career we've tried to distill some of the wisdom of um, various people around the UK and worldwide. And so we hope that whether you're just starting out in your career or whether you're well down the path, you'll find it a useful resource. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Um, how do you think the report will help maintain um, already rather excellent standards of radiation protection in radiotherapy in the UK? Well, I think they're already very good, but the report will help to maintain this situation with contents on the latest legal requirements, uh, the most recent physical data, methods for calculating adequate shielding, and the specific, specific operational factors for different equipment types. For example, the IMRT factors for some of the specialist equipment, and all this needs to be taken into account in designing a safe and successful facility. Okay. Um, we have just have one, another one through that asking um, about specific room design. So are there any discussions in the book on doorless room designs for LIMAC? Yes, there are. There's, um, the, the, the shielding calculations can be implied to a, a doorless, or, or doorless room design, not a direct door. Yes, the, most, most of the book, is, is, most of the book uh, uh, chapter 5, is, is about uh, doorless designs with a maze and in fact there's quite quite a, a number of worked examples showing the benefits of having a three-legged maze as a two-legged maze to, in order to achieve the dose and dose rate constraints so certainly doorless bunkers are, are discussed uh, at great length and can the help book at all um, sorry can the book help at all with modifications to existing bunkers Yes, I, mean, I think we, we hope we've tried to go through, as Pat said, a number of worked examples, but without necessarily setting out one design as the, sort of the only option. And we appreciate that often when you're replacing a LINAC or you're trying to um, upgrade a facility, you are having to work with what's there already and that you need to assess the adequacy of the shielding that's already there, and that all comes into part of the procurement process. There's also details in uh, Chapter 7, I think it is, about the individual features that you may come across within a particular design. So there might be lintels, ducts, cableways, um, nibs that are there or aren't there, and the exact shape of the maze. And those principles will hopefully be applicable to uh, modifying an existing bunker as much as designing one from scratch, which I think is becoming a, a rarer situation where you have a completely new build. Mm. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Um, the last few questions are actually related to purchasing the book, so I'll just give I'll just cover that quickly. Um, the um, the report is available um, now. It's published this week, and it is available from um, online retailers such as um, Amazon. Um, if it's if it's not available right now, it should be very very shortly. Um, the IPEM members are entitled to a 30% discount on on this title. Um, as you can see on the screen now, there should be um, a link on there which will take you through to our um, distributors where you can put the code in for the checkout there, IPEM30. Um, also, through your IPEM membership, 
we have made available the electronic version. Um, uh, that's on IOP Science. Uh, if you have any other inquiries, if you'd like to contact us at ebooks at iop.org, um, we can get back to you that way with the best way to get hold of the book. Um, we've got time, just had another question come through, so I will just read that out for you. Um, cyber knife shielding, uh, sealing of bunker can be secondary barrier. Is the restriction on movement of the cyber knife arm a technical limit or to minimize the shielding needed for sealings? As I un as I understand it, the um, the the, o the 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 operation of the of cyber knife is is technically restricted, not to go above 22 degrees above the horizontal. So it's a, a technical limit, as I understand it. But it does help, as as we've said, to minimise the, the shielding in the ceiling. But this may not always be the case. Apparently, I'm I'm not personally have no personal experience of cyber knife. David, do you have any information from Mount Vernon? Um, I know you can set the restrictions um, different in different centres. So if you want to restrict it sort of from superior and inferior directions, that is possible. I suspect not having it pointing vertically upwards is to do with the fact that it can't actually get under the couch without the patient being quite high. So maybe the 22 degrees is a, is a compromise in that respect. And often the arm wouldn't go right over the patient and sort of underneath the other side, I guess, as well, because then you're avoiding collisions. But that's something that you could discuss with Accurate directly in terms of the, the the options for limiting or allowing greater range of movement. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that's all, all we've got time for now. Um, but um, thank you both very much for your presentation. Thank you for everybody um, for listening and taking part. We hope you found the webinar um, useful and obviously of interest. Uh, the on-demand version will be available within the next hour on our website, um, iopscience.org forward slash books. Um, there will be um, there's a link there to our webinar page. could ask you if you could rate this web webinar after you finish listening. That would be really useful. And also, please do share with any colleagues um, that, you, that you think might find it of interest or find the report of interest. Please do share it with them. Uh, thank you very much. This webinar is uh, is now over. Thank you.